And so we've got uh, uh, two speakers. Um, I'm going to just give them introductions now. Uh, the first one is Scott Willis. He is a professional engineer from uh, from AELP. He's the generation engineer, the power generation engineer, actually. He's been living in Alaska for 24 years, um, and he's been working at AELP for uh, 12 of those years. And um, his background is in water resources, um, and he has a, uh, a bachelor's and a master's degree in civil uh, engineering. And um, he's going to uh, talk to us about um, Juno and uh, AELP and uh, hydropower versus fossil fuels. And uh, following that closely will be, uh, will be David Lockard from the Alaska Energy Authority. Uh, he manages bulk fuel and uh, uh, powerhouse construction. Uh, and he has uh, also a, um, a handle on geothermal ocean and, uh, and river uh, power generation technology. He has 15 years of experience in Alaska, or rather been living in Alaska for 15 years, and he has 14 years uh, of experience with the Alaska Energy Authority. Uh, he has a master's in, uh, in, uh, from the University of Wisconsin uh, from the Solar Energy Lab there. And with that, I'll hand it over to Scott Willis. Soldiers had been on maneuvers. They hadn't had uh, a hot meal or a hot shower in two weeks. The general came by to rally the troops and got them all in, in uh, order and said, men, I have some good news and bad news. The good news is everyone gets a change of underwear. And a, the cr crowd started to roar, and pretty soon a private in the back said, and what's the bad news? General said, you change with him, you change with him, you change with him. We'll have a little bit of good news, bad news stuff today. Um, uh, I appreciate being invited to come speak uh, to this. I really enjoy speaking about hydropower. <clears throat> um, it, but Sanjay made a terrible mistake when he uh, titled the, uh, the, uh, my presentation, Juno Hydropower, Past, Present, and Future. He didn't know that I'm starting to get old, and like old guys, we start to think a lot about the past. And I've been collecting some historic pictures and things from... Uh, uh, that we have at the company, so I'm going to bore you with a few historic slides, but there is a, a modern lesson uh, in it for us. Juno's modern history uh, began when gold was discovered here in 1880, and that was the economic driver that provided all this benefit. And there was a, the local butcher and the person that had the slaughterhouse uh, had heard about this newfangled invention about the light bulb and thought, you know, I bet I could get people to, to buy uh, light bulbs and electricity from me. So he went out to Gold Creek, put up a little diversion dam and installed the, uh, the uh, uh, pipelines necessary and the power plant necessary to uh, put a little hydro unit using uh, Gold Creek um, power. And he started a company in 1893 called Alaska Electric Light and Power Company. Still exists today, still providing uh, power to Juneau, uh, still primarily with hydropower. Here's a picture of the inside of the Gold Creek plant. Have I got a pointer? Is there a, that a possibility? Maybe I'll just wave my hands. Um, yeah, cool, okay. This, this picture was taken about 1913. Here's a hydro generator. You see these valves? That valve's the, the, the water that comes through and turns a water wheel inside here, which is connected by a shaft to this electric generator. Uh, I, I guess I should say hydropower is taking, to, to generate hydroelectric power, you need water, and elevation. And so when you get water up high, whether, whether it's with a high mountain lake or whether it's impounding water behind a dam, you take that potential energy in the water, you run it down a pipeline, that, the water goes faster and faster and faster, it goes downhill, and you shoot it at a water wheel, and that gives you the power to drive this electric generator. There's another one on this other side. There's a, there's a hydro turbine in there powering that generator. The interesting thing about this picture is that you see that you see these this big pulley and these big belts here's another uh, angle there these are connected to a steam turbine and the idea is that they generated hydropower when they had enough water in gold creek to to make that power and then in the winter time when gold creek froze over they used their steam steam boiler steam turbines here with belts hooked to the, to a shaft hooked to the same generator so they could spin the same generator um, in addition to uh, uh, selling hydroelectric power to the uh, residences and, and uh, uh, businesses in, 
Juno, the mines themselves needed power to, to uh, power their mills. And so the Treadwell mine, which was the big mine on Douglas Island, they went out the Eagle Crest Road and dug a ditch from there, dug the Treadwell ditch all the way around past Douglas to Treadwell and uh, developed a hydro plant there. That wasn't enough, so they went out to Sheep Creek, out Thane Road, and put in a hydro plant out there. They also went up to the glacier and diverted Nugget Creek and built a little uh, powerhouse right at the toe of the glacier, Mendenhall Glacier. Even that wasn't enough, and the Treadwell Mines had a steam plant uh, that, that provided uh, power when there wasn't enough hydro. You can see an oil tank over here. This is the Treadwell Tennis Court. You can see the ruins of this if you hike the, the Treadwell Trail on past Sandy Beach. The Alaska Gasnel Mine, which was out at Thane, thought that hydro looks pretty good because they realized, like the butcher and like the Treadwell people, that hydro, the bad news is hydro is expensive to build. You have to build dams and pipelines and so on. The good news is hydro is really cheap to run because Mother Nature provides the fuel, the water that runs the hydro plant in the form of uh, rain and snowfall. So uh, our general manager likes to tell people that we're paying exactly the same price for fuel today that we paid over 100 years ago. It's nothing because Mother Nature provides it for us. So the Alaska Gas No Mining Company went up on Salmon Creek, built the Salmon Creek Dam, built a power plant near Tidewater, and um, had hydropower that way. That wasn't enough, so they went up the Taku to Annex Creek and built the Annex Creek project there. Uh, that still wasn't enough from time to time, so to power their mill out Thane Road, they built this steam plant with this oil tank here feeding it. Um, let me just pause here and say the good news is that hydro lasts a really, really long time. The Salmon Creek plant I just showed you and the Hydro Creek plant I just showed you, as well as the Gold Creek plant that I showed you earlier, those plants are still in service today and are generating some of the electricity we're using in this room today. So the good news is hydro lasts a really, really long time, and there's no bad news to that one. The AJ mine, which had the mill uh, on just above South Franklin Street downtown, was late to the party. They didn't have any hydro to develop, so they had to build this steam plant here. That building may look familiar. It's still there on South Franklin with those oil tanks there. Um, so that's the, that's the history. The, the, the point I think we can take away from Juno's uh, uh, history is that they used hydro when they had it and they used oil when they didn't. And we're still in that situation today. Let's talk more about our, our present day situation. These, I think, are 2006 statistics that show where the United States gets their electricity. All, uh, the, the majority of it comes from coal gas, oil, these are carbon-based sources, gives us most of our electricity throughout the country. Nuclear is about 22 percent, hydro 7 percent, and what you would consider uh, alternative energy or, or the classic renewables, um, a, still a very small percentage. Juno is different than the rest of the country. In Juno, in 2006, we got 99.5 percent of our electricity from hydro and a half a percent from oil. That's remarkable. There's no other community in the country that has a higher percent of renewable energy providing their electricity than Juneau. In fact, the only communities that I think can come close to us are other communities in southeast Alaska where we're blessed with a lot of water and a lot of elevation. Communities like Sitka, Ketchikan, Petersburg, Wrangell, those communities that are hydro-based. So, so this is really a, a remarkable situation for us to be in that almost all of our electric generation today comes from renewable resources. Okay, next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the future. This slide shows from 1970 out to 2040. So we have like a 70-year range uh, that shows where we've been with our uh, electrical energy demand. So this shows how our electrical loads have grown in Juneau uh, throughout history from, from 1970 to today, and then how we think they might grow for the next 30 plus years. The other line I have on here shows our hydro resource. So 
So when you build a hydro project, it comes online, and the, en the electric energy you get from it depends on how much water there is in the stream you're tapping, or the lake you're tapping, or the reservoir that you've impounded. And so it's, it's, a, it's sort of a finite thing. You get a certain amount of energy out of that hydro project. So in the 70s, the hydro projects we had were these old projects that were built in the mining days, Salmon Creek, Annex Creek, and Gold Creek, and that gave us, oh, something over 50 gigawatt hours of, uh, of electric energy a year. And you can see that back in the early 70s, our town's demand exceeded our hydro capacity. So in addition to running these hydro plants, we were also generating with some diesel to, to meet this, to meet this uh, gap. Federal government then came in and built the Snedishem project, phase one of the Snedishem project, and all of a sudden we went from this level of hydro capacity to this level of hydro capacity, far in excess of what we were using. So Juno enjoyed a, a long period where we had plenty of hydro, needed very little diesel in this period of time because we had plenty of hydro capacity at the Snedishem project, in phase one of the Snedishem project. At, at eventually Juno's loads grew to where the demand for electricity exceeded the hydro capacity, and the federal government came in in the uh, mid-80s and constructed phase two of uh, the Snedishem project. We were once again back to a hydro surplus situation. Loads continued to grow in town, uh, greater economic development in town, people used more electricity, um, until about now when we have just in the last year or so exceeded our average hydro supply. So our, our normal loads in Juneau exceed our normal hydro supply. And now we're back to generating what extra energy we need, what we can't get from hydro, just like we have for the last hundred years, hydro when we have it and oil when we don't. There's a little bit of oil at the margin. Now, looking ahead, we've got another hydro project out there that was identified many, many years ago, the Lake Dorothy project. In fact, it's a phased project also. Here's phase one. And when phase one comes online, it's under construction now. We're building that. It's, it's, uh, it's just on the other side of the Taku River. Um, when it comes online, it should put us back in a hydro surplus situation. And that will last us for quite a while, depending on how our loads grow. Depending on how much more electricity Juno needs, if, if we percent project a 6% 0.6% load growth, we don't need our, another, our next hydro project till we get somewhere out here at 20, you know, 2037 or something like that. And that would be kind of nice to have these hydro projects last that long. But I did a load forecast recently with a different assumption saying, suppose we had a lot of fuel switching. Suppose people that heat their homes with oil now decided to switch and heat their homes with electricity. What, what might happen to our load growth? Well, that would, that would mean that we needed more electricity and our loads would grow more rapidly. Uh, let's say they grew at 1.3% per year. All of a sudden we exceed phase one of Lake Dorothy, not in 2037, but in 20, you know, 2021. And then we're looking at bringing the next, we're looking at generating with some diesel in this time until we can get phase two of Lake Dorothy on. So the good news is that we have the Lake Dorothy project out there and we have a phase two out there. The bad news is we don't know exactly what comes next after this. There's a picture of the Lake Dorothy project. Um, it's under construction now, should be online next year sometime, uh, we expect. Uh, as we think about what comes next, we think that there may be other possible hydro projects out there, maybe not as large as Snedishem, um, maybe smaller projects. Uh, there may be projects in other parts of Southeast that if we had a regional electrical inner tie, that we could tie in other possible projects, say down in the Petersburg area, tie those back into the Juneau area or other projects. That would be one way that we might continue to be able to meet Juno's electric growth with uh, renewable energy. Other possibilities that we're considering would be wind. Uh, Southeast Alaska is not the ideal wind regime, but there are places where it may make sense. Um, there, there could be tidal resources somewhere, and this is something that we need to uh, look at also. I guess what I wanted 
what I want you to take from this is that the, our hydro picture is kind of a good news, uh, bad news situation. The good news is that we have hydro that provides 98% uh, of the electricity that we need. It's, re it's clean, it's renewable, it's zero carbon. The bad news is that it's limited. And when you start talking about shifting a lot of load that's not currently electric load to, uh, to our electric system, that could cause us to exceed the capacity of our hydro resource and need to generate diesel at the margin. Um, so I guess that's, that's what, I would, uh, what I would hope that you would take away from this brief presentation, that we're, we're very, very fortunate to have the hydro resource that we do, uh, but that it is limited. Uh, it, I would, uh, it sounds funny from somebody that's in the business of selling electricity, but I would sure like to see lower load growth because that would make our existing hydro projects last much longer than very high load growth. So that's all I have. I think we have a few, a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Yeah, so a, a note on the format, we have 10 minutes here for questions for Scott, and then Scott will also be on a round table at 10.50 to 11.50, and during that hour, you'll have the opportunity to ask, ask and hear answers to more questions then. But we have time for about 10 minutes now, and I again ask you for, to wait for the microphone. I was just curious, your 0.6% load growth, mm -hmm. is that right? Um, how much energy conservation do you have taken into that number, and what else is in that number? So, so that number um, includes some, um, that had a fairly mild uh, uh, economic growth, that there would be some new businesses come to town, no new government jobs, some new tourism jobs, so there was that kind of thing. A little bit of load growth in the commercial sector and government sector. It included conservation in that, in that the idea that uh, it didn't include a, let's see, how should I say this? It didn't include a, a sort of a, a major new effort in conservation, but it did include the idea that when people buy new appliances, when I replace my 20 year old refrigerator, the new one I buy is going to be more energy efficient. So we've seen. Um, particularly in our, in our uh, residential electric heat customers, we've seen them use less and less electric energy per year. And, and that 0.6% was assuming that, that they continued to use energy at that low amount. When I got back to that 1.3%, uh, that was assuming that, that they would change and then they would turn around and start using more and more electricity. So there is, there is some conservation in that, but not the idea that, that when, when we hear um, presentations like the one we just heard, we'll all be motivated to really make changes in our lifestyle that, that could allow conservation. That's not in there. So, so there's the possibility that that could be even flatter if, if people really took uh, conservation and energy efficiency seriously. I was wondering, one of the, in terms of looking at the alternatives uh, for the future, you know, let's tidal and, and, and wind. I thought AELMP provided some of their own energy needs through ground source heat at their, at their Juno office. I was just wondering why that wasn't part of the thinking for, for the future. And I, I think even the, the airport's planning and their renovations to use ground source heat, I'm wondering what's that as far as potential for Juno? Okay, uh, that, that's correct. So, so what we, the way we provide heating and cooling uh, in our office building is with what, what they call a ground source heat pump. And what that does is that circulates fluid down, down some wells into the ground, and that fluid is warmed by the, gr by the ground temperatures. Not that we've found a uh, geothermal resource or steam or hot pockets or anything like that, but if you go down 100 feet, the ground down there is warmer than freezing. And so, so this fluid picks up that little bit of heat, maybe the, maybe the ground temperature's 40 degrees, I don't know. It brings that 40 degrees up, and then we run it through some compressors to concentrate that heat, and that can turn into 90 degree heat to heat our offices with. Um, and so that is really a neat thing because if you have normal electric resistance heat in your home, uh, you've got baseboard heaters like I do, 
at my house, you turn on the heat, electric current flows through and, and heats this wire and, and provides heat, I'm getting a kilowatt hour of heat for, for every kilowatt hour of electricity I'm putting in there. With a heat pump, that's really energy efficient because you take one kilowatt hour of electricity to, to pump that um, fluid down the ground and bring it back up and compress it, and you get two and a half or three kilowatt hours of heat out of that. You're not making heat, you're just moving it from the ground and concentrating it. So heat pumps are a, um, a really good energy efficiency kind of thing. There are a few homes in Juneau that have heat pumps. Uh, the, the airport is looking at putting one in for their uh, expansion. We've got some, there are some in town. They're a little bit expensive to put in, so it's sometimes hard for a homeowner to justify that, but they are an efficient way to do it, and we would like to encourage uh, uh, more heat pump installation. Did that answer the question? Uh, Scott, um, I have a question about uh, future demand, and this is, and this is in the context of uh, uh, the potential for first conservation, which you've alluded to, and I can imagine lots of people buying uh, the correct light bulbs and the correct appliances, but there's two other things that are going on that might um, influence how people are going to consume electricity in the future, and one of them, of course, is price of fuel and then also the whole, whole issue of carbon emissions. And those two issues combined are going to motivate a lot of people to switch their um, heating to electric. And I can imagine a mass um, uh, exodus from oil to electric for heat. And so what would happen to that demand curve in Juneau if the majority of Juneau switched to um, heating with electricity? This little, the little curve I've got here actually doesn't anticipate any new switching. What I call this electric heat curve here is saying <clears throat> we had a lot of electric heat in Juneau that switched to oil heat in the uh, early to mid-90s. Monitor stoves became very popular, and, and the poor guys like me that heated their home with electric heat saw oil heat as being a lot cheaper, so we bought these little monitor-type or Toyo-type stove and put in, and I turned off my electric heat and was heating with oil because it was saving me a ton of money. And so there's, there's been a, we think there's been a shift away from electric heat to oil. Well, n now oil costs so much that it's roughly equivalent to the cost of heating your home with electricity. It, it may be slightly more or slightly less, but it's, it's, it's roughly equivalent. And so we think that there are people that, like me, that have electric heat and oil heat saying, man, this oil is really expensive. I'll turn that off and go back to my electric. So this load forecast I have here was just getting back some of the electric heat we think, we've, we, think we lost uh, 10 years ago. If there was a mass shift of people that only had oil heat or businesses or, or offices or something like that switching to electric heat, this curve would be much steeper and we would exceed our hydro capacity much sooner, maybe bring on another project if the community could afford that, but, but when we get out here, when we exceed the capacity of our hydro projects, we're back on diesel supplementing with diesel. It's much more efficient for you to burn oil to heat your home than for us to burn diesel in our generators to provide you electricity to heat your home. In term of the, in, this is really weird, and I think I've got enough time to explain it. You're, you're me, and you can heat your home with electric heat or with oil heat. If I really want to do my part to reduce our community's carbon footprint, our community's carbon footprint, which heating system should I use? You would think, use your electric heating system, because that's hydro-based. In reality, because we have a little bit of diesel energy at the margin, in other words, the next, the next kilowatt hour right now is generated with diesel energy, which is 25% efficient, and my little monitor stove is 85 or 90% efficient. I use less, the community uses less carbon by my burning, my heating my home with that high efficient oil stove than switching to electricity, which has to be generated in electric generators. Did that approach your question, or do you have a follow-up to that? Uh, you should heat with oil. 
It, so, so that it's like, it's like there's a temporal aspect to what you're suggesting. There, there is, and there's also there's also a, a timing aspect with re, with relation to where we are in this, in where our loads are compared to our hydro resource. If we have surplus hydro, it, it, see, in the in the early years of these projects, we'll have surplus hydro year round, uh, and so so yes, heating with electricity at that time would reduce our our community's carbon footprint. But when we get out here to where we're having to supplement with that with diesel, every kilowatt hour, every kilowatt hour we use uh, uh, for electric heat is a kilowatt hour that we'll have to make up in diesel later on. The other thing is it gets even more complicated than that because most of our hydro projects here are storage projects. And what energy I don't use in the summer can be stored in the lakes and used in the wintertime. So it, it's even more complicated than that. So we have time for one more question here, and again, we'll have an, a full hour at which to, to ask more questions. So I'll just for efficiency's sake, okay. Was there? Is that it? No, wait. Okay. There was one behind you. Okay, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, are we positive that these new dams and these new phases are being built in stable watersheds that are not going to change over time and I mean we've seen a lot of streams and watersheds decrease in flow so I mean has there been any uh, projection for that? Put into these? So so prior to bringing on a hydro project one of the important things to do is to determine how much water you can expect over a long period of time and the nice thing is the mining companies were looking at developing a lot of these projects they started taking stream flow measurements at the turn of the last century. Um, and so, so we have some pretty good records for things like Lake Dorothy, in, in, in saying where we came from. Now, if your question is, what might the future hold, and might there be a change, say, a global climate change? I see we have a, a, a presentation coming up uh, that would, that's going to talk about that. The, the answer is, we really don't know. We, can, we need to look at what uh, climate change models are telling us, and if they're telling us that stream flows are going to be increasing in the future, that's great for hydro. If they're going to be diminishing, that needs to be factored in. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Scott.